get started. Um, I want to introduce everybody to John Jenks. Um, John is currently the Director of Public Policy at the Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce. Um, he's been with the Chamber for over three years and oversees the Chamber's advocacy efforts um, in Kansas City, or I'm sorry, in Kansas, Missouri, and also heads up the Chamber's workforce opportunities for returning for the Returning Citizens Initiative that looks at reemploying and reintegrating people that le people leaving our prisons. Um, he also oversees the public advocacy work centered around criminal justice and reentry policy. He has also helped to create the Chamber's um, Greater KC Report Economic Dashboard that highlights and recognizes key economic and policy areas in the Kansas City area. John also has a deep passion for politics and has served on various campaigns, including the Better KCI Airport campaign that passed overwhelmingly in November 2017 and campaigns during his time in Mississippi. Um, John grew up in the Kansas City area and graduated from the University of Mississippi Sally McDonald Barksdale Honors College and Trent Lott Public Policy Leadership School with a degree in public policy leadership and, and economics and a master's in integrated marketing communications. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to John. Thanks for being here, John. Thank you, Ash. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now, so. And should be up. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And I'm really happy to be here uh, tonight to talk about public policy and advocacy and, and kind of my world <laughs> that I live in. So um, just to kind of get started a quick, um, you guys kind of heard my background, but I did go to Ole Miss, the University of Mississippi. I uh, got my degree in public policy, leadership and economics. And I also played for the ice hockey team there. They do have uh, ice hockey in Mississippi. And and uh, actually played against all the other SEC schools um, while I was down there. But we had to go up to Memphis to practice, which is like an hour away, a little over an hour away from, from where that school is. So um, if you guys can see, uh, that's my uh, three-year-old Weimariner, three-and-a-half-year-old Weimariner uh, dog named Archie for Archie Manning, who played, it was Peyton and Eli's dad, um, and he played at Ole Miss. And um, I also have the vote stickers there. I am a policy and politics um, uh, wonk. I love it. It's It's been a uh, passion of mine ever since I was in, in um, gosh, grade school, really, and, and I've been following it ever since, and now I'm making a living out of it. So um, just to kind of get started, I wanted to um, give a little background of the Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce and our public policy department specifically. I know for me, I had no idea what a Chamber of Commerce did prior to joining the Chamber of Commerce uh, three, a little over three years ago. So um, just to, to kind of level set with you guys, with you all on, on this. Um, we have over 2000 members actually. Um, uh, about 40% of them are on the Kansas side and the rest obviously on the other side of the state line. We represent, I think it's over 130,000 employees of those businesses in the Kansas City area. Um, as a result of being on both sides of the state line, we are very active in uh, Kansas and Missouri politics. And um, also because Kansas City, Missouri proper does not have its own chamber of commerce, um, we represent a, um, we are kind of the de facto KCMO chamber also. So a chamber of commerce, is, as you can imagine, is a collection of businesses, um, nonprofits, um, government entities, um, and anyone else really who wants to be a member um, that comes together to advocate on uh, policies and, and um, public policy um, in the city, state, and federal levels. We also do a lot of programming um, centered on leadership development um, through our Centurions program, through networking. Um, I'd say that's probably the next biggest chunk of, of, our, of our work is, is the networking for um, new business uh, new businesses trying to grow their client base um, and for for um, you know workers in the Kansas City area just trying to grow their network um, and, and then the policy aspect and that's what I'm about to get into and I do apologize for my graphics I am not very uh, savvy when it comes to <laughs> graphic design and stuff so uh, the public policy department really kind of covers four areas um, advocacy up in up in Topeka and Jefferson City and DC and at City Hall in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, our economic uh, forecasting and economic development work is also under the public policy department at the chamber. 
Um, we also hold the um, a lot of workforce development, workforce inclusion, and we also um, house the uh, leadership um, events at the chamber. And I'll get into some of that here in a second. Issue areas, um, because we have over 2000 members, you can see we are all over the place. We uh, were involved in anything from criminal justice to uh, workforce development, to education, to um, healthcare, specifically uh, Medicaid expansion. Um, we've been very active in, in both states on that. And I'll get into that. And here are some of the committees. I'm not gonna bore you all with, <laughs> with descriptions on all those committees. Um, except for the bottom one, the bottom one there on the right-hand column, the Workforce Opportunities for Returning Citizens um, Committee is, is uh, specifically related to criminal justice and getting folks coming out of our prisons, um, we call them return, returning citizens, trying to get them employment. Um, and that's been a big effort of mine that I'll get into. Some of the events that we do, the leadership exchange, uh, we take like 140 business leaders to a city, um, when COVID is not happening <laughs> and we, we learn best practices from that city. So two years ago, I think was Nashville, three years ago was Denver. Um, last year was supposed to be Salt Lake City, but um, COVID and um, this upcoming year is to be determined pending um, the progress on, on uh, the pandemic. So some other ones are there too. Um, I'm not gonna get into all of them. I will get into the BizPAC. Um, a, the BizPAC is our political action committee. And if you're not familiar with political action committees, um, it is a committee that is formed um, to advocate and to um, fundraise and to give money to political candidates and to political causes, ballot initiatives, for example. Um, we do have um, about 15 members of that uh, committee and they um, endorse candidates and ballot initiatives as needed. And then our Kansas and Missouri State Affair Committees and our KCMO Committee advise the chamber on, um, on what to advocate for. It's important to remember with the chamber that we, we don't advocate on what John Jenks wants to advocate on or my boss wants to advocate on. We have to listen to our members and these committees allow us the opportunity to get input and to get direction on our advocacy work. So, um, as much as I'd like to advocate on my own things, it's probably <laughs> it's probably a good thing, and and it's good to get direction. So, um, but really, what I wanted to talk to to everyone about um, was this idea of advocacy and civic engagement. And I, I found this definition on the internet, and I liked it um, of of civic engagement. Civic engagement can be defined as individual and collective actions designed to identify and address issues of policy public concern. Um, so it's pretty self-explanatory, but I, I think it did a good job at encapsulating really what, what being engaged means. And it's, it's trying to enact change um, for, for the, you know, the, for the good of the community. And civic engagement can look in a, a whole host of forms. It could be voting. That's a form of civic engagement. It can be letter writing. It can be campaigning. Um, it can be fundraising uh, for a cause. It could be giving for a cause or a candidate. Um, it could be um, uh, volunteering. Um, it could be a whole host of these things. And I, I don't think I need to go through each one of these, but I am going to get into the specifically the political advocacy part of um, of, of uh, civic engagement. So I, I was I was thinking about this. Um, over the weekend and, and last week about really like how to describe advocacy because I've never had to describe advocacy before and it's it's kind of fascinating I did a google search and and uh, I found this article about about advocacy and it said the one of the first lines in the article was there is no pure form of advocacy um and it takes on many different forms and I was like wow okay so I'm not I'm not I'm not the only one that is kind of having a hard time describing describing what it is um, but I think more importantly to, to understand how to be an advocate and how to engage in advocacy, it's important to understand there's, there's really two types of politics that I like to think about. I think of formal politics and I think of informal politics. 
And formal politics is um, kind of that show that you see on TV um, or, or the show that you might see on the news where they're debating in the, in the House chamber in, in the Capitol um, or they're in a committee hearing and somebody's testifying in front of that committee. Um, that's that formal politics where you're, you're in the Capitol, you're in the legislature um, and you're, you're dealing formally, um, for lack of a better term, with, with government entities, right? And then you have the informal politics. Um, the informal politics is that, that conversation with your friend or family, um, for better or for worse, at the uh, kitchen table. And uh, you're, talk, you're, you're discussing politics. You're discussing your thoughts, your beliefs, your, um, your outlook on, on where, um, where things are at. Um, I also think of informal politics a little bit as, uh, a, a, as, as kind of um, uh, organizations, community events, maybe even organized protests um, or, or assemblies, stuff like that. And that's that more of that grassroots um, advocacy work that you hear about where, where it's kind of a community driven um, um, uh, initiative, if you will. So, um, but I think that's a really important concept that really is just kind of lost. And I think that line is becoming even more blurred these days with social media um, and, and uh, the internet, really. I think that that line of informal and formal politics is, is just becoming even more blurred. In fact, I just saw this morning that I guess the last Congress set a, a record for the amount of social media activity they did. And it's like over 2 million tweets and Facebook posts and all that. And, um, when you're engaging directly with citizens like that, um, that, that, that line between informal and formal politics is, is blurred. So, um, as I said, no pure form of advocacy, um, but the, probably the, the best closest definition that you can get to advocacy is, is what's on the screen. Advocacy is an organized political process that involves the coordinated efforts of people to change policies, practices, ideas, and values that perpetuate inequality intolerance and exclusion. It strengthens citizens' capacity and decision makers and builds more accountable and equitable institutions of power. So it's really the people acting. <laughs> and um, so, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of ways to become involved in, in advocacy work. Um, it, I think the first is educating yourself. Um, I, I, I know I, I have to with my job, but I, you know, I constantly am staying aware of, of the news. And I really stress to people, um, and I hold myself accountable to this, to get your news sources from one, credible sources. Um, you know, your eighth grade classmate um, that's tweeting about something probably isn't the most credible <laughs> usually. Um, but getting yourself getting your news from credible news sources and a variety of news sources too. I, I know I generally read like 10 newspapers a morning. Not that saying not that saying everybody should be doing that, but I just try to get a wide variety of perspectives on issues. Um, um, just just so I really can understand all sides of, of, of the issue and I'm not getting um, you know a a Fox News's um, views or MSNBC's news or just you know whatever so um, I really stress to people that, to that and I think I think educating yourself about the issue or issues um, is really the most is, is, is critical step number one or otherwise you're not going to be a very effective ab advocate um, some other ways I think you know we all know and we all saw um, the largely peaceful protests that happened last year after the killing of George Floyd obviously um, there's that was extremely effective, right? I mean, our, a lot of things have forever changed because of because of those um, protests, powerful protests. Um, I, you know, another way too, if you're if you're really starting to kind of get involved, is to sit in on a legislative hearing or city council session. Um, most of the time, um, especially in the smaller cities, um, around even in the metro, um, you know, you can go to Independence or Parkville or. Um, they, they have open, open uh, time for any citizen or any group to get up there and speak at the city council hearing. 
Um, when you get when you start getting to kind of larger bodies like Kansas City, Missouri City Council and the Missouri uh, General Assembly and the Kansas Legislature, you um, you really start to uh, have to go to the hearings, to the committee hearings, and you have to stay up to date on that. And I'll get to that here in a bit. Um, another way is through the petition and initiative process. We just saw last year that Medicaid expansion passed in Missouri because of this. Um, to be quite frank, for people like me, sometimes this could be a, a nightmare <laughs> um, um, for a variety of reasons. But it's a very effective policy tool if you have the if you have the time, resources, and, and money uh, to to do a particular petition or initiative uh, referendum. Uh, the city of Kansas City, Missouri, also allows for citizen-driven uh, petition and initiative process. And there's a whole step-by-step -step thing that you have to follow um, for that. And then quite honestly, uh, calling your legislators or city council members um, is ex way more effective than anyone realizes. I mean, and I'll get to Congress here in a second, but <laughs> I, I, I was talking to somebody uh, last week about this and they were like, well, tell them that five count, five calls to a city council member becomes a crisis. And what she meant by that was, if a council member at the Kansas City, Missouri City Council gets five phone calls on a particular, particular issue, he or she is gonna think that it is a legitimate crisis and it needs to be solved now. Um, whether it really is or isn't, they believe that because they're hearing it from different folks, right? So. It, it is way more effective than you can think. I was in fact, uh, earlier today, I was on a phone call with um, a Kansas legislator and he was like, I've been on phone calls all day with constituents and stuff. So it's, it's um, very effective. Also, you, you know, you can look up and I'll show you in a second um, how to look up your legislator. He or she, almost all of them have meet and greets um, in the, uh, in, within their district, so. Um, now, Congress is a little different if you're dealing with congressmen and congresswomen and, and senators is, is very different. Uh, one, they're in D.C. most of the year, or a lot of the year, I should say. Two, they're not going to pick up the phone <laughs> and they're not going to call you. Um, they don't call me. <laughs> um, but they do have a they, they do direct their staff to keep a running tally for the day to see how many phone calls are received on particular issues. So say it's the, I don't know, the uh, stimulus checks. Uh, they legitimately keep a tally and most responsive, responsive, responsible, and good congressmen or women will get a report about that at the end of the day or the, or the following day about how many phone calls were received on that particular issue. Um, so it is effective, like I said. And then lastly, get on a campaign. Um, you know, it it's, hard, it's time consuming, it's often volunteer work, but if you are very passionate about an issue, um, uh, campaign work is, it can be rewarding and honestly can lead to some doors opening, so. And then um, kind of kind of just building off this, who, who can advocate? Well, obviously individuals can. Um, 501c4 and 501c6 organizations can. C4s are those PACs I was just talking about, uh, political action committees. And C6s are like a chamber of commerce. Now C3s can advocate, but they're, it's a little more restrictive and they have to um, be a bit more educational <laughs> when they do it. Um, and I'm not gonna get into the laws on that, it's, it's a little boring, but, um, but it, it's kind of interesting on who can and who can't advocate. So uh, legislative days, uh, legislative days are actually, uh, very effective and they're popular and um, and I it's kind of weird not having them this year because of COVID um, at the capitals. But uh, you know, a legislative day is where you get your group, your organization, your committee uh, together. You plan messaging, you plan uh, uh, literature that you're going to leave the legislators, and you plan meetings. You call ahead and plan meetings um, for the whole day uh, with the various legislators legislators at the Capitol and you meet with them throughout the day uh, to discuss your priorities. Um, it's, it's actually a pretty cool, uh, cool to, uh, tool. And I know the legislators like it too, because they get tired of seeing people like me and, <laughs> and, and other folks. So um, it, it's, it's a very, very effective tool. And then to find your legislator, I, I don't think I'm gonna, um, I don't know if I can bring up the other 
um, link to this, but I, I could I could send this to Ash and she could send it out to you all. Openstates.org is a great find your legislator tool. You pretty much just put in your zip code and you can find your not only your congressional delegate um, or senators and representative, but you can also find your state reps and city council members. Um, just to just to stay educated on on uh, who who is representing you in in Jefferson City or Topeka or DC or at City Hall. Um, it's um, most people have no idea who is representing them anywhere, um, even Congress a lot of times to be quite frank. So um, that's a great way. And then these two links too um, under this under the uh, uh, the hearing. Those are the legislative links that you're able to go to, and and any hearing um, at the state legislature is open to the public. Um, and if they are accepting testimony, is open to public testimony in which you can um, do written testimony and be on the record of supporting or opposing a, a certain bill, and um, or you can go in person and testify. Now this year. Um, is is kind of unique because um, you can actually testify remotely due to the pandemic and, and social distancing guidelines at the capitals. So it's it's been it's been kind of nice, been kind of weird, but um, it's it's very neat. So that's a great way to stay up on on um, what's going on at the capitals and 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 being able to stay informed and engaged. Um, and then when you when you. I, I can't stress this enough either. So besides educating yourself, but when you when you are advocating, it's it's important to, as I said, not only educate yourself, but really educate the the lawmaker when you are talking to him or her. Because I've seen it sometimes where people will go into an office and they'll say, you know, work this bill for me and we need this bill passed, and they have no idea, the legislator has no idea what this bill does or doesn't do. <laughs> So educating, 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 laying that groundwork, and then going in with an actionable item is critical. Um, and also keeping it short, succinct, and fairly simple for them is, is also uh, keeping, keeping the literature, the, the description of the advocacy or, um, or uh, issue is, is incredibly important too, because they get thousands or you know, hundreds of those a day. And, and oftentimes, especially if it comes in an email, it's probably going to get lost. So short, succinct, attention grabbing um, is, is critical. So the other thing I wanted to, uh, the, the other thing I wanted to talk about, I, I hope this isn't too much like a civics class, <laughs> the, this slide, but this, this iron triangle thing, I always think about this because this is really how um, policy making happens. And you know, you have at one end, you have the bureaucratic agency or the executive branch. So you have like the governor's office. At another end, you have the legislative branch and, and their committees. And then at the other end, you have advocacy groups and special interest groups or uh, lobbyists um, that serve as advisors, influencers and whatnot. And all three of these interact with each other very differently and try to influence each other differently. You have a government agency that's trying to push their agenda into the legislature. You have a legislature that's trying to push their agenda on a government agency. You have a legislature working with lobbyists that are supposed to be experts in, field, in, in the field. Then you have lobbyists working with the governor's office. So it's kind of that just interchanging of ideas and, and networks of of people and, and ideas that kind of makes policy click. So I don't know, I just, I always think about that and I thought I'd share, so. But uh, kind of getting towards the end of, of my presentation, I wanna answer questions too, I'm open to answer any question. I just kind of wanted to go over some hot issues going on in the uh, in Missouri and Kansas um, specifically um, going on right now. So. As I said earlier, this session, this legislative session in Topeka and Jefferson City has been unlike anyone's ever seen. Even the seasoned lobbyists that have been up there for 30 or 40 years, they said, first off, they've never seen uh, the legislature working this fast and furious so quickly. Um, both legislatures are afraid that they're gonna have to close down for a few weeks. Um, so they're trying to get as much work done as possible um, at the beginning. So that includes committee hearings, um, votes on the House and Senate floors, um, other stuff. It's It's been very, very, very busy, um, but fun. 
So in Missouri, um, obviously COVID's number one. Um, COVID liability um, coverage for businesses and schools and stuff like that has been a real priority. Um, and, and it has been a priority for the business chamber too. Full disclosure, we've been working on it. Um, the, the idea is, is to provide businesses some protection from lawsuits and litigation if they are doing a good faith effort at maintaining a safe working environment. So, you know, wearing masks and social distancing and stuff like that and following the government guidelines. If they're doing that, then um, the business community and uh, both, uh, really it's kind of a bipartisan thing, believe that this, that the business should not be subject to, to a lawsuit that could, whether they win the lawsuit or not, it could put them out of business. Um, and then vaccine distribution. I think we've all heard about that. I know I've heard about it ad nauseum, but um, interestingly, we've been, the Casey Chamber has been asked by a few of our members, our um, industries to become priority on the vaccine distribution list. Now, it's really, it's kind of out of our control and we really haven't done a lot with it just because a lot of that is set at the federal level um, with Department of Homeland Security, so, and HHS, uh, Health and Human Services. So we, we've we kind of just, you know, worked with it, but, but it is becoming an issue and availability is becoming an issue. Now I did just see like an hour before we got on, um, the new Biden administration announced that they're buying, gonna be purchasing 200 million more vaccines um, to, with the goal of vaccinating every American by the end of summer. So um, we'll see where that goes. We'll see if the vaccine um, makers are able to produce, um, produce that many this quickly. So it'll be interesting. The other thing coming up with COVID is uh, after all the shutdowns, especially last year, a lot of legislators, especially the more conservative legislators, we're upset with the emergency powers that health boards and health directors hold. Um, they want to curtail their ability to do long-term shutdowns of businesses. Um, as, you know, we've heard of the bars and restaurants being shut down notably. So that's come up too. Um, we'll see where that goes. Um, but other than that, besides COVID, uh, transportation has been a big issue. We've, um, or the, the General Assembly is trying to to raise more money <laughs> to pay for roads and bridges. Missouri is subject to um, a tax cap basically where they can't really raise taxes without going to the people for a statewide vote. Um, so it's very difficult to raise money for things like better roads, expanding roads. For example, they want to expand I-70 across the state to six lanes. It's four right now, mostly they wanna to go to six. Well, it takes a lot of money. Um, and, uh, and, and it's hard to do that in Missouri. So workforce development has been a big issue in Missouri, especially since Governor Parson took over. Um, uh, workforce development's a big issue to the chamber too. Um, last year we were, uh, very instrumental in getting us, us and the women's foundation actually were very instrumental in getting occupational licensing reciprocity passed, um, between, um, between states. So if you're a, um, you know, I, I don't know, say you say you're a barber in Wichita and your family's moving to Kansas or uh, moving to Missouri, that Kansas barber's license will be good for, I forgot, I think like it's, it's a year or two years or something like that. So you can practice barbery in Missouri um, until you're able to get the Missouri license, uh, occupational license. So we're also trying to work on some other um, occupational licensing reforms to break down barriers for people to enter the workforce. Early childhood education is um, becoming a hot topic issue in Missouri. The governor's office is restructuring some uh, early childhood and daycare uh, and childcare um, departments and agencies, trying to put them all under one roof and has really been stressing that this is a workforce development and economic development issue. So we've been, we've been happy to work on that too. Medicaid expansion implementation, as I said last year, the voters of Missouri passed Medicaid expansion um, and now the uh, onus is on the legislature and the governor's office to implement it. Uh, the legislature is expected to throw up some roadblocks to Medicaid expansion uh, implementation, but um, there's really not much they can do because it's a constitutionally mandated program now, so they have to abide by it. And, um, but we'll be working 
to make sure it's fully implemented. And then criminal justice reform, that's really kind of one of my specialties. Um, this, uh, we look at, as I said, a lot of the, the re-entry programming. So working with Missouri Department of Corrections on increasing educational capacity inside our prisons. Um, and then when they come out, breaking down barriers for them to, to re-enter the workforce, you know, encouraging employers to ban the box. Um, encouraging the state to ban the box on their applications, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm happy to answer more questions on that too. In Kansas, a lot of the same thing, um, liability coverage for businesses if, um, um, from COVID, COVID cases, vaccines. And then they had to extend the emergency orders <laughs> uh, for the governor until March 31, or they had to extend it prior to today, actually. Um, and they extend the, extended that out to March 31, but they're probably gonna extend it for the rest of the year. So criminal justice again, in fact, in Kansas though, we are working on a, a pilot program with the Kansas Department of Corrections at a, for a career campus at the Lansing Correctional Facility. And it's going to be a facility where businesses, employers are able to go in, educate inmates and um, do job interviews, um, it potentially even hire them if they can do work inside the prison or hire them for um, a job upon release. We, um, we're really proud to, to be working on this and really quite honestly leading it um, in the state of Kansas. Workforce development again, don't need to go through all that. And then um, taxes, uh, there's been some property tax issues in the state that's pretty big and, it, and income tax issues. Um, related to the tax cuts, I think well, 2017 or 2018, I think 2018. Um, there's some stuff that the states each have to do to, to really benefit from the full tax cuts. And then lastly, the, the uh, divided government. Uh, Governor Kelly is a Democrat um, and the legislature is overwhelmingly uh, Republican. So just trying to balance their, that, that you know, fine line of working together is going to be interesting to watch. So. That's really all I had. Um, I'm happy to answer answer questions or, or discuss anything. Ash, I'll turn it back over to you. Um, it looks like I have one question right off the bat from Megan. Um, is the license like that for both sides of the state? I assume that means state line, but Megan, please feel free to jump in. Yeah, for the, when you were talking about the barber license, I own a salon and so, oh. Is that license work like that for both sides now? So um, we're trying to work on it in Kansas, actually. We're, we're okay. hopefully to get legislation passed in Kansas um, this year. Because when I you went from Missouri to Kansas, yeah. um, I went probably 15 years ago. It took me six months and I've been in the industry for 20 years and I actually had to call the legislator to get it done. <laughs> See, that's what we're trying to break down, right? <laughs> yeah. So it prevents a lot of people from going because you can't do it, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And in fact, the, we really heard about it first from our military affairs committee with um, soldiers and their spouses moving to Fort Leavenworth um, from, say, North Carolina, and they weren't able to practice whatever in the state of Kansas. It was uh, in Missouri for that matter, but that's fixed. So. So yes, no, we are trying to work on that. Um, okay. The governor's supportive of it, but you know, the, the more they hear from people like you, um, <laughs> if you want to talk about real advocacy, oh yeah, it's it's a real problem, and the more they hear about it, um, the more they well, understand. it prevents it prevents people from going to work in states. Yep, Absolutely. which is foolish because you got taxes. <laughs> you got taxes and uh, workforce development's an economic development issue, and, and right. the more people that are. Um, retiring, you know, the population's aging, baby boomers are retiring. We're going to have to replace people in the workforce. And even, you know, I, I, I'm a data nerd with, with jobs and stuff. And even the, the amount of jobs we've been able to get back, even from the shutdowns, and the amount of jobs that are out there right now is pretty staggering considering where we were, you know, seven or eight months ago. Wow. Well, thanks yeah. for doing that too. <laughs> yeah. So I have a question. Um, so we are, we're still waiting to hear back on Kansas, but I know in Missouri, we are doing a virtual advocacy day on March 23rd. Um, so what are, what are you doing to be successful right now when advocating um, virtually instead yeah. of in person? No, it's, a, it's, 
It's a great question because it's, and quite honestly, we're all still trying to figure it out too, um, a lot of ways. But for the most part, it's phone calls. Um, it, I'm on the phone a lot and it's a lot more handholding, I feel like, with people, um, with the legislators. But, um, but in terms of more large scale advocacy, we are doing um, the, the group Zoom things. So back in December, we were able to get the Missouri, um, the, the, there's a Kansas City caucus in Missouri that is a caucus of legislators from the House and Senate that are from the Kansas City area, greater Kansas City area, Missouri side. And we got them together on a Zoom and <clears throat> we went over our five or six priorities uh, with them. And then we, uh, we asked them for their priorities too, you know, just so we can have a, have a little dialogue. But that's, that's really the best way. So it sounds like you're kind of on the right track with that, uh, with doing it that way. So, um, and then a lot of it too now is electronic, um, electronic testimony or email testimony. So I've had to, um, so in Missouri, they're, they're really limiting the amount of people that are in committee rooms. So um, as a result, if long story short, you're just having to email the people to be on record that you support or oppose a bill. So that's, that's changed too. Now, Kansas allows the virtual testimony. So I'm able to just do a WebEx um, into, the, into the committee hearing and testify like this. So, but no, yeah, I, getting, getting the folks on a um, group Zoom and, um, and talking, you know, trying to keep it short, you know, 45 minutes to an hour at most um, and going over your priorities is the way to go. Okay. It, it is fascinating though. I mean, we are literally all trying to learn <laughs> how to do this right now. It's, it's, it's kind of weird. I completely understand. <laughs> I feel like I'm doing the same thing right now. So um, just trying to get a hold of everybody. Um, we just met on, I met with, um, so there's four junior leagues in the state of Missouri. We usually have an advocacy day together, um, but obviously that's not going to be possible this year because of uh, COVID but we are still doing something virtually. So I met with them on Friday and there's, they're going, we're moving forward. So wanted to get your input on that. Yeah. Well, if you need any more advice, I'd be happy to. I'll, yeah. I'll talk to you <laughs> offline about getting. Yeah. That yeah. Kind of but, yeah no, um, I'd be happy. To, yeah. Awesome. Um, and can you also cover maybe like the difference between lobbying versus advocacy? Because I feel like there's a lot of confusion surrounding this topic. <laughs> well, <laughs> lobbying, lobbying is kind of a bad word to a lot of people, right? So <laughs> um, it's not as bad as it sounds. And, you know, House of Cards isn't entirely true. And <laughs> um, but no, I, I don't know. I, I, to me, I don't know if there's like a technical difference, to be quite honest. Um, but to me, advocacy is a little more grassroots, a little more community driven um, uh, work. Um, lobbying, I guess, is probably a little bit more formal and where you're um, actually working bills in the legislature. So, um, you know, you're, you're offering amendments to a legislator to, to put onto a bill or to change language on a bill. Um, you know, you might be doing some more um, formal fundraising for your political action committee or, or um, formal maybe dinner or something with a legislator. But um, really in the, at the end, you know, both are trying to accomplish the same thing, um, which is policy change, whether, you know, no matter how it looks. So um, I hope that answers your question. But yeah, I don't think there's really a technical difference. Um, I think they're both the same. Yeah. This one gets paid by a company to do the advocacy. And my family had a lobbying firm. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> I'm from Jefferson City. Oh, okay. And, um, but I, you don't tell people that because as soon as you do. Very safe company here. So. <laughs> yeah. so one is like doing it because you want to do it and advocacy. Yeah. And then lobbying, I think, is more when you get paid. You might not really care for that situation but you go out and do it yes exactly right <laughs> <laughs> i was trying to be a little more political but yeah no i mean i'll be honest i you know there's some things at the kc chamber that that i have to advocate for that i'm like you know me personally john jinks personally i don't really know um but like you said they're paying me and i gotta do what they say <laughs> 
You know, what's always amazed me is why don't the legislators know what's going on? I mean, like we put them there, but they wait until an advocacy or a lobbyist comes and tells them about it. It's the million dollar question. <laughs> and and I always like it too, because they wait till the very last, like the last three days of the legislative session to get everything done. And it's like, mm -hmm. it's like yep. Um, no, you know, there are some that are legitimately um, knowledgeable, very up to date. And, and, and obviously those are the people that I love to work with because they don't require any handholding Republican or Democrat, if, you know, they, they just get it and they're going to do what's right. But then you have the other ones that are in it either for ideological purposes or it's income or I don't know, you know, they're just in it probably maybe for not the right reason. And, and yeah, they don't know what's exactly going on <laughs> in the real world. So I, it's a million dollar question. <laughs> Can you go more into the prison program? Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to, yeah. So um, it actually started about two or three years ago and we started it, um, well, I'll even back up before that. We started our workforce development program about four years ago. And um, because you know we were at record unemployment, employers literally could not find anyone to work and especially in certain industries. Well, um, about a year went by and we ended up getting into uh, some kind of criminal justice work. And we were kind of feeling, we knew we wanted to get involved, but we were trying to feel our way into, <clears throat> into that work. We ended up meeting with some other chambers of commerce around the country that were already involved in this work. And they really ranged from the job placement side to the just policy side, policy and advocacy side. We ended up kind of merging those together and we founded the Workforce Opportunities for the Experienced Citizens Program. That, that program specifically is kind of two. So one, it's a job placement program for folks getting out of our um, prisons uh, to get a job with our members. And then two, uh, policy, and I do the policy work. And then a third stool has kind of come in and that is that career campus that we're trying to at Lansing Correctional. So uh, about a year ago at this time, we met with the Corrections Secretary of Kansas and he said, um, <clears throat> yes, you know, let's, uh, let's get going. We had a major benefactor, um, a part of this, he major Kansas City and um, a part of this, and he donated the necessary money to <clears throat> um, put a temporary facility inside Lansing to begin the the educational process there. But now we're in the process of, or close to the process of fundraising. Um, it's gonna take $30 million for the project to launch. So we're in the process of fundraising and then also securing money from the legislature to, um, to, uh, to launch the project. It's, it's, a, really fa it's a really neat um, program. We, we've kind of modeled it. Michigan uh, Department of Corrections has a thing called Vocational Villages. And we've kind of modeled it off, off of that, but this is also very different. So, so the, the goal is though, is to put it in every Kansas prison and then obviously bring it over to Missouri um, to, to their facilities and hopefully be a national model. Um, so right now, I think we've, we've started with welding um, because it's, it's a great paying job. <laughs> they need them. They're gonna get a job when they get out. Um, and in fact, you know, it's, it's kind of, funny is not the right word, but um, it's, it's fascinating that, I mean, I've had major employers in Kansas City say, we need workers so bad that pretty much we don't care what their background is. <laughs> as long as they're qualified and they're going to show up, we don't care. So um, I have some and, that own huge like plumbing companies that do like the big, res, you know, that not residential plumbing, but the huge. And that's what they say. Like they just need humans that know how to do it. Yep. Yep. But exactly. It's so hard, like, to get on some job sites if you have, you know. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we're trying to work with the legislature too on that. On, you know, is is whatever you know is. Let's just make sure that the crime fits the the restriction. You know, if if you were if you got caught with cocaine possession at age nineteen and you're still barred from whatever. I mean, and you're in your age 40 and haven't really been in trouble ever since. Who cares? I mean, right. <laughs> that person just happened to get caught. We could have all probably gotten caught for some at some point. I know I could have. <laughs> so. 
That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, it's yeah, I, I, it's been a real passion of mine, and I kind of got lucky that the chamber um, let me lets me do this. So, um, but yeah, I would I would be expecting to see some more stuff really from us um, about our work in at Lansing. It's, it's really neat. That's cool. I have another question. Um, so in a conversation with Scott Hall, um, he brought up that Danielle, and I don't think, is Danielle still with you guys? She actually just, uh, her last day was last Friday, I think. She moved back to Seattle. Okay, well done. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> she was working on a project about family-friendly workplaces. Do you know anything about that one? Yeah, I honestly don't. <laughs> I, I could take a guess. I, I I do know that she was working with uh, Sesame Street um, oh. on on a really cool program. Sesame Street, like I, I don't know the exact specifics, but they send out these like boxes of, of um, like a toolkit, basically of boxes to families that request them, and it's um, educational material and stuff like that. Well. The only reason, the reason I know about it is Sesame Street has a new character that is a, um, that is a child of someone whose parent is currently incarcerated. And part of these boxes now are designed for kids, um, or some of the boxes are designed for kids whose parents are currently incarcerated. Um, so we've been sending those out to um, people that have requested them. So I do, I do know that. And I, I would imagine that was part of it. I know Danielle was also very involved in our early childhood education and childcare um, work. In fact, she was helping our president and CEO on the Kansas um, Early Childhood Educational Council, something like that, um, yeah. work over there, so. I think Joe and Scott may have both spoken about that at a different junior league event, um, okay. C3KC. Um, a while back, and I, that was, I think I chaired that event two years ago. So it was around that time, I think that we talked about it. Um, so I just, we haven't heard anything since. And I think we had talked to Danielle about potentially doing a training with us, but now that she's gone, <laughs> let us yeah, know. No, when I, I, <laughs> I'm sorry, I should have, I should have probably studied up a little bit more on that, but. No, I don't, I think it was a side conversation between myself and Scott. So completely okay. understand what <laughs> Um, so it is a priority for us, though. I mean, and, and I know I'm probably going to be starting to get more busy in that work in the next year. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. Does anybody else have questions? Anyone? Well, if you don't have any questions, I, Ash has my email and y'all can. You know, feel free to shoot me an email if you have any other questions or, or whatnot, so. That's great. Thank you so much for doing this with us, John. Um, we appreciate you so much for that. And of course, we appreciate the Chamber and all that they've helped us out with throughout the years. So thank you so much. And um, if I have any questions um, sent to me, I will go ahead and send them to you and have them answered. Sounds like a plan. Awesome. Thank Thanks, you. John. It was really good. Yeah, thanks. Y'all have a good night. You too. You too. Thank All you, right. John. Yep.